Hello and welcome. I welcome you to Bible Knowledge in Form 3. Today we are proceeding with the uh, Deutero Isaiah as we'll be looking on chapter 41 and chapter 40, chapter 41, 44. So we'll be looking at a number of issues. So the main issue is the assurance, God's assurance to Israel. He is assuring the people in exile that he is the one to be trusted. I am your teacher, W.A. Maoa. By the end of this lesson, we should be able to analyze the work of second Isaiah in the following parts. The first one, looking at God's assurance uh, to Israel based on chapter 41, verse 1 through 20. The second one, we have also to look at the work of the same Isaiah where he is talking about the Lord to be the only God. So he is assuring people that he is the only God. On the other part, we will look at chapter 41 uh, where we will look at uh, God is challenging false gods. So the Lord's challenge to false gods. Then we will also look at Idolatry is ridiculed. So God is laughing at the idolatry. People are busy with idolatry. So to ridicule, uh, ridicule is uh, to laugh at something. So we are going to look at these uh, issues or these areas. So by the end of this lesson, you should be able to understand deeply these issues. So be there up to the end. God's assurance to Israel, chapter 41, verse 1 through verse 20. Relate what God said to assure Israel of his favor and protection in this passage. Remember the book to be your handbook is this one. This is the Good News Bible. So I'll read part of uh, chapter uh, 41. The rest you have to, to read. So let me introduce to you the passage. What is it talking about? Chapter 41, verse 1. God says, Be silent and listen to, to me, you distant lands. Get ready to present your case in court. You will have your chance to speak. Let us come together to decide who is right. Verse 2. Who was it that brought the conqueror from the east and makes him triumphant wherever he goes? Who gives him victory over kings and nations? His sword strikes them down as if they were dust. His arrows scatter them like straw before the wind. He follows in pursuit and marches safely on so fast that he hardly touches the ground. Who was it that made this happen? Who, who has determined the course of history? I, the Lord, was there at the beginning. I, the Lord, will be there at the end. I've read up to verse 4. So from there, you can proceed, read up to the end. So, what is God saying to assure Israel in favor and protection of he, uh, in this pass, passage? So Israel is I saying that Israel is my servant. Israel are the people I have chosen. I brought them from the ends of the earth. I called them from the farthest corners of uh, the earth. He's also saying, don't be afraid. I am with you. He's also saying, I am your God. Let nothing terrify you. Remember, we are just reading there uh, the part to say he sent the conqueror. But nothing should control you because him he is the controller of history. So God he is the controller of history. Nothing should terrify you, I am, uh, and or let nothing should terrify you because I am your God. 
I will make you strong and help you. I will protect you and save you. This is what is being said in the passage. So what would happen to the enemies of Israel according to the passage? So those who were angry with Israel will know the shame of defeat. Those who fought against Israel will die and disappear from the earth. Let me read maybe a bit, a bit further. Let me read from uh, verse 5. The people of distant lands have seen what I have done. They are frightened and terrible and tremble with, with fear. So they all assemble and come. The craftsmen help and encourage one another. The carpenter says to the goldsmith, Well done, the man who beats the idol smooth encourages the one uh, who nails it together. They say the soldering is good and they uh, and they fasten the idol uh, in place with nails. But you, Israel, my servant, you are the people that I have chosen, the descendants of Abraham, my friend. I brought you from the ends of the earth. I called you from its farthest corners and said to you, you are my servant. I did not reject you, but chose you. So I have read up to verse 10 there. So you can see there, uh, uh, God is assuring Israel to be uh, his friend, uh, his servant, the descendants of his friend, Abraham. So we see here, that the enemies will disappear. Describe the loving care of God for his people. So he says there will be the abundance of water uh, and there will be good vegetation symbolizing the well-being of the people. So here, when you go further, his, God is trying to speak or to, to say that he is going to provide more for his people. Explain what the Jews need, uh, why the, Jew, the Jews need not to fear. So why the Jews need not to fear? Why? So God is assuring them that they should not fear. Why? Because Yahweh chose them as his own. He keeps his promise to their ancestors. He does not abandon his people. He will make them stronger than any and any enemy and will protect them they will gain total victory over their enemies so here we see that this is the assurance to them that they should not fear because god is always to their side so what would be the result of making israel a threshold let me go further so that you should be understanding these things from verse 10 do not be afraid. I am with you. I am your God. Let nothing terrify you. I will make you strong and help you. I will protect you and save you. Those who are angry with you will know the shame of defeat. Those who fight against you will die and will disappear from the earth. I am the Lord your God. I strengthen you and say, do not be afraid. I will help you. Verse 14, the Lord says, small and weak as you are, Israel, don't be afraid. I will help you. I, the Lord of uh, the Lord, the Holy God of Israel, I am, uh, I am the one who serves you. I will make you like a thresh board with spikes that are new and sharp. You will thresh mountains and destroy them. Hills will crumble into dust. You will toss them in the air. The wind will carry them off and they will be scattered by the storm. Then you will be happy because I am your God. You will praise me, the Holy God of Israel. Up to verse 16. So what would be the result of making Israel a, a threshing board? So we see here. He is saying that she will thresh mountains and destroy them. Hills will crumble into dust. She will toss 
hills and mountains in the air and wind will carry them off. She will be happy and praise God. So we see here, this will be uh, making Israel great because all the enemies now will be brought down to the surface. How did God show that he is in control of history? So he is the one that brought the conqueror, Cyrus, from the east. He is the one who made him, that is Cyrus, to be triumphant wherever he went. He is the one who gave him victory over kings and nations. So, so those people who seem to be great by this time, the Jews were fearing Cyrus because he was just conquering the nations. So, in other words, people were looking at Cyrus as the one who is going to change the events. But no, the events are controlled by God. And he is the one that make him strike nations and kings down as if they were dust. He is the one who made him scatter nations and kings like straw before wind. He made him follow in pursuit and marched safely on so fast that he had he hardly touched the ground. So his his movements as he was uh, as Cyrus was conquering nations. It was as if he was just sweeping, as if he was just running in the air without touching the ground. So there, God is saying, he is the one who made him so strong. He was there at the beginning, and he will be there at the end. So he is the controller of the world. So what did the people of distant lands do in reaction to what God had done? So... When the people see what God has done, what are they going to see? What are the people going to say? So the people, they are going, they were frightened, they trembled with fear, they assembled together, the, the craftsmen, the people who, uh, who make things using their hands, the craftsmen, help, helped and encouraged one another to make the, an idol. The carpenter also encouraged the goldsmith Men who beat the idol smooth also encouraged one, the one who nailed it together. So this is uh, what the people of distant lands do in reaction to what God had done. So what does it mean? The carpenter encouraged the goldsmith or they helped uh, or encouraged one another to make the idol. People were in fear when they hear that the Lord is the one who is controlling his, uh, history. He is the one who is letting people be defeated. So they trembled and they came together, coming together to start uh, analyzing the things and making things to say, all right, let's make the idols. Let's make our gods to be as strong as the uh, Yahweh. What was the significance of such reactions? So they worked together to make an idol that they thought would defeat the Lord of Israel, but their efforts would be fruitless. What does the prophet teach about God and his purpose in this passage? So in this passage, what do we get about Yahweh and his purpose? So Yahweh is the Lord of history. That's what we get. Yahweh is holy. His thoughts are not like the thoughts of man. Yahweh is the God of all nations. His salvation is universal. He serves the people who believe in him. Yahweh uses Cyrus to free his people and to glorify his holy name before all nations. So we see here that the main thing that Isaiah is trying to say is God is great. He is the controller. He uses different things or different people uh, to control history. And his salvation is universal. Small and weak. What does this statement mean? It means the Jews needed God's tender love and care. So the Jews, for them to survive, they needed only the love of God and his care because they are small, they are weak, they cannot do anything, they cannot stand against the strong nations. God's love for Israel is so dear, so it also shows that God's love for Israel is near, is dear, is deep. 
Israel is defenseless without Yahweh. The Lord is the only God. Isaiah 44 verse 1 through verse 8. In this passage, we see that God is showing that he is the only God. He is the only one uh, the people can depend on. Chapter 44. Remember, we cannot do anything without this book. We cannot get anything. Let's just read it a bit. Chapter 44, verse 1. The Lord says, Listen now, Israel, my servant, my chosen people, the descendants of Jacob. I am the Lord who created you. From the time you were born, I have helped you. Do not be afraid. You are my servant, my chosen people whom I love. I will give you water to th I'll give water to the thirsty land and I'll give water to the thirsty land and make streams flow on the dry ground. I will pour out my spirit on your children and my blessing on your descendants. They will strive like well-watered grass, like widows by streams of running water. One by one, my people will say, I am the Lord's. They will come to join the people of Israel. They will each mark the name of the Lord on their arms and call themselves members of God's people. I've read up to verse 5. So how did God show that he is the only God according to this passage that we have read? So here you can remember, you can uh, see to it that he is saying that he is the first, the last, the only God. There is no other God apart from him. The, he alone had predicted what happened. So we see here. Let me proceed to verse uh, 8 maybe. The Lord who rules and protects Israel. The Lord Almighty has this to say. I am the first, the last, the, law, the only God. The, there is no other God but me. Could anyone else have done what I did? Who could have predicted all that would happen from the very beginning to the very end of time? Do not be afraid, my people. You know that from ancient times until now, I have predicted all that would happen. And you are my witnesses. There is, an, is there any other God? Is there some powerful God I never heard of? That's it up to verse 8. So he says he is the first, the last, the only God of Israel. There is no other God apart from him. He alone has predicted what, what happened from the ancient times. He alone created Israel. He alone created all things. He alone stretched out heavens when he made the earth and no one helped him. So here he is showing the greatness, his greatness. God is showing his greatness to say he alone created everything. What did God say to convince Israel to return therefore? So he says, Israel is my servant. So it's like uh, a father calling a child who is maybe uh, and rule a child, say, ah, no, you are my child, you are my child. So there is trying to convince the child to come, uh, to come closer. So Israel is my servant. This statement, God is producing to convince Israel to return to him. The people of Israel are the people I have chosen. I will never forget you. So he's trying to, to bring them near. Although they are sinful, he says, come. And near, you are my people. I have swept your sins away like a cloud. I am the one who serves you. I am the one who created you. So you see there, he's trying to convince Israel to return to him. How does God guide the following groups of people? The fortune tellers, he makes full of them. Astrologers, he frustrates their predictions. Wise men, he 
refutes their words and shows that their wisdom is foolishness. His servant, he makes his plans and predictions come true. So he is the one who guides history. For the fortune tellers, he makes them to look foolish. The astrologers, those who study the stars and say the future about the stars, how they look, then they predict the future. He frustrates their predictions to say, look at the star, ah, then something will happen, then it doesn't happen. He frustrates their prediction. For the wise men, he refutes their words and shows their uh, foolishness as well. But for his servant, he makes his plans and predictions come true for the servants. What predictions did God make in this passage? In Jerusalem, people will live there again. That's number one. Number two, cities of Judah will be rebuilt. Cyrus will rule, uh, will rule for him. Number four, Cyrus will do what he wanted him to do. Number five, Cyrus will order Jerusalem to be rebuilt. Cyrus uh, will order the temple foundations to be laid. That's number six. So we see here that God is making the predictions here. Another passage is the Lord's challenge to false gods. So God is challenging the false gods. So explain what God what the gods of the nations are called upon to do. So when we read in uh, from verse 20 up to verse 29 in chapter 41, we see that God is challenging the false gods. From verse 21, The Lord, the King of Israel, has this to say. You gods of the nations, present your case. Bring the best arguments you have. Come here and predict what will happen, so that we will know it, we will know it when it takes place. Explain to the court the events of the past and tell us what they mean. Tell us what the future holds then we will know that you are gods. Do something good or bring something, uh, bring some disaster. Fill us with fear and awe. You and all you do are nothing. Those who worship you are disgusting. I have chosen a man who lives in the east. I will bring him to attack from the north. He tramples on rulers as if they were mad, like a potter trampling clay. Which of you predicted that this would happen, so that we could say that you were right? None of you said a word about it. No one heard you say a thing. I, the Lord, was the first to tell Zion the news. I sent a messenger to Jerusalem to say, your people are coming. They are coming home. When you look among the gods, none of them had a thing to say. Not one could answer the questions I asked. All these gods are useless. They can do nothing at all. These idols are weak and powerless. So that's the passage. The passage is talking about the false gods. So explain what God, the gods of the nations are called upon to do. So God is challenging them to say, explain the past, predict the future, do something good, bring about disaster that we should see that you are really the gods, the controllers of history. How does the Lord show that he is the controller of history in this passage? He had chosen Cyrus from the east. We read that one. He would bring him to attack from the north. He chose him to trample on rulers as if they were mad, like a potter trampling on clay. We read that one. He was the one who had predicted that it will happen. So here he shows that now 
he's challenging the false gods to say, show us that you are great. But now listen, I have chosen someone from the east that is science. He will be attacking from the north and no one will stand because he will be just trampling on the nations as if that he is trampling on the mud soils like that. So he is showing that he is the controller of history. Outline the arguments to prove that only Yahweh is God. So from the passage itself, how do we see that Yahweh is God? He is only God. Because he's challenged the other side. But to his side, how do we know that he is God? So he knows the past and the future. He knows the meaning of events. He performs signs and wonders which inspire admiration and fear. He controls Cyrus, even though Cyrus is not aware of it. The idols failed to predict Cyrus' victory. Idol worshippers are disgusting. So from the passage there, we see that God is showing himself to say he is the only Yahweh. He is the only God because he knows the past. He knows the future. He knows the meaning of the events. And he also, whatever he does, that one calls for admiration. People, they admire. So it is God who has done that one. And people are also afraid to say, what? No, 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 no. This is so terrible. So he controls even the things that people or the people that are there, the strong, are being controlled by him, even though them they don't know. Here we see Cyrus is being controlled by God, but him, Cyrus, doesn't know about that. Yeah, so we see that. And the idol worshippers are disgusting. So what does God say to challenge the false gods? So we read that one, he says, where he says, Come and predict what will happen to us uh, so that we know it when it takes place. He said that. Explain to the court the events of the past and say what they mean. So he alone knows the meanings. But these, these gods, other gods, they can't. Tell us what the future holds. He's challenging these ones to say, tell us what will happen in the future. Do something good or bring some disaster here so that we should know that you are the gods. So that's a challenge to false gods. Still more, the last part of our today's lesson is to look at the ridicule. Idolatry is ridiculed. That is, is laughed at. Idolatry is laughed at. I'll just read a little, a little of that part, uh, chapter 44. The Lord is the only God. The Lord says, from verse 6 now, the Lord who rules and protects Israel, the Lord Almighty, uh, better we take it from verse 9, therefore, verse 9, all those who make idols are worthless and the gods they, they prize so highly are useless. Those who worship these gods are blind and ignorant and they will be disgraced. It's no good making a metal image to worship as a god. Everyone who worship it will be humiliated. The people who make idols are human, human beings and nothing more. Let them come and stand trial. They will be terrified and will suffer disgrace. I've read up to verse 11. What is idolatry? So this is the worship of anything as a god. So what is an idol? So idolatry, idol. So what is an idol? It is anything that is worshipped as a god. So that is an idol. Why did Jutro Isaiah attack idolatry? So number one, because it hates his love for Yahweh only one of Israel. So it takes, it substitutes God of Israel. So second Isaiah hates that one. His fellow Jews tempted to believe in the idols of Babylon. We talked about it to say they admired the idol worship of Babylon, then they were attracted. So Jutra Isaiah hated that one. The attack on the faith 
on idol gave comfort. So the attack on the faith in idols gave comfort. Yeah. So when he was attacking the, those ones, it was giving comfort to say, no, you cannot worship these things, only worship God. Idol worship was meaningless. How does God make full of idol worship? So he says, idols are made by man, yet a human being cannot make a god. The energy and skill of idol makers uh, idol makers, are, uh, and the materials used are all God's gifts. So all the skill, the power, and whatever are from God. So they are the materials of God. The same tree that is used to make a god is used to make fire. So that is really uh, foolish to worship that one. Explain now the meaning. Explain uh, negative effects of idol worship on the people. So people will be, will be disgraced. So people will be disgraced. They will be humiliated. People will be terrified. They will become too stupid to know what they were doing. They will be too senseless to admit that idols are not gods at all. So these are the statements that we get from the same passage there. So people will be disgraced. They will be humiliated. They will be terrified. Suggest some of the idols that are worshipped today. So people today, they worship wealth, spouses, celebrities, children, positions, leaders, businesses, and the like. You can mention them. The people, they substitute God for maybe things that make them busy. So business uh, can be uh, spouses, wealth, and the like. Suggest reasons why people are afraid of abandoning idolatrous practices today. They fear losing their status in society. So people, they cling to worship idols even today because they fear losing the status if they lose that one. They fear losing their wealth, fear losing their life. They fear also uh, becoming deformed. Say, uh, maybe... I uh, will not be the same again if I don't, I don't worship these things. So I thank you so much for following this lesson up to this far. Indeed, it has been a long lesson, but worth it. So if you have any question, please, uh, you can ask. And for further studies, you can also follow zulendo.org. Uh, for the resources, you can follow these, you can look at these references again. Uh, they will provide with you additional information on the same. But until next time, I am your teacher, uh, W.A. Listen to the voice of substance.